Hi, everyone. Good morning. This is Bin speaking. Today, I'm your moderator, and I'm glad to have Lu Chiu from Luxio here to present you a bursting spark of Presto jobs to AWS using Luxio. So we will start in a few minutes. So before we start, um, I want to have a few housekeeping items. So all the participants are automatically on mute throughout the session. We will be using Slack to communicate. So please take a moment to join us. Actually, before this session starts, I already added all the registers to a Slack community cha channel. So in case you have any issues, please post uh, your question regarding the talk on Slack channel. However, if you have trouble joining the Slack, feel free to message me uh, your question instead, and I will share it with the group. Um, in today's session, we have a brief presentation, and then we will have a QA session in the end. We can answer all the questions. This will also have a demo Lou will give to show you how you can just run a uh, basically a cluster remote to AWS and burst your Presto or Spark workloads into AWS. So, uh, yeah, actually, before we start, maybe Lou, how about yourself? Uh, introduce yourself a little bit. Hey, I'm Lou, a software engineer currently in Alasio. And basically, what I'm working on is to integrate Alasio to the public cloud, like how we are more easily to use Alasio in our public cloud environment, such as the AWS and also the Google Cloud. So today, so this is why I get, will give this demo, uh, this presentation and also the demo of how to run some compute workloads in AWS using Alasio. Cool. Uh, so actually, I want to point out one thing. Today, the topic is bursting Presto Spark jobs to AWS using Alasio. So this is about how to use Alasio as the bridge to connect your uh, in cloud, in public cloud computation to your on-premise data warehouse. However, if you have any questions related to Alexio, I'm happy to answer because this is the office hour. So, uh, I mean, uh, it's as, as long as you think this is related to Alexio, the workloads, internals, configuration, I'm happy to help. It doesn't need to be related to the topic today. Okay, so maybe we can start, Lou. Yeah. Now let's start in our presentation. So basically today we will talk about the bursting spa or Presto jobs to AWS using Alasio. So basically we will give a solution. That's the hybrid cloud solution. And we want to talk about how we come up with this solution and why this solution may be useful in your environment. And we will give more details about this solution and also a demo of running Presto queries using remote on-prem HDFS data with Elastio involved. And all the environments will be deployed in AWS ENR. So I think in many of the companies in the early ages, we have a Hadoop distributed file system in our data center. And then we think that, okay, maybe we want some of the compute workloads, like we want to run some Presto or Spark queries or some machine learning queries. The most easy thing that we do is that we just put everything in the single cluster to co-locate it with our Hadoop distributed file system. However, there will bring some problems. First, that everything is, will be in the single cluster which is really complex and hard to maintain. All those compute frameworks and your Hadoop and distributed file system will compete for all the resources, like the CPU resources or other things. So it may affect the stability of the HDFS and also affect it to be expanded. Like as more data come in, we may want to add more Hadoop workers. However, the Hadoop name node because there are many compute frameworks compete for the resources. So the Hadoop name node may not be able to handle more workers, which means more capacity. So in this case, we may think that, okay, if the single cluster doesn't work in this case, as we compute grow, keep growing, so maybe we will consider to separate our compute and our storage. 
like we have a single Hadoop cluster, which, uh, which only have HDFS. And we have a different compute cluster, which holding our compute frameworks. And in this case, if the two clusters are close enough, the data transfer will be really will not be an issue because you are close to each other. However, in these days, as uh, as uh, we have more of the data driven strategies, usually we want to make the compute closer to our end users. Like we want to give some recommendation to our users really quick. So we may put our compute to many different regions, all the regions that are closer to our users, but have the data center in one or two locations, which means that the compute and data center may be in different regions and they may be a far away. So that brings us, that brings the data transfer stage into consideration. Like if, if our Presto and Spa, they're running from the data that is remote, that will take a lot of time and effort to transfer the data, which may affect the compute performance. And if we throw more money into the data transferring part, like if we build more power, give more powerful machines for the data transfer, it may be really costly. So in this case, we may bring Alasio into consideration. And for you guys who are not that familiar with Alasio, Alasio is basically a data orchestration layer between your storage and your compute. Basically, you, Alasio will help fetch the data from your storage, no matter it's local or remote. And it will provide those data for the compute framework. And because usually Alasio is co-located with all the compute frameworks, like co-located with Presto or Spark. So it will catch in the working data for those applications so that Presto and Spark will think that, oh, my data is local. So I don't need to go to remote to fetch it again and again. Alasio will catch in the data and also providing the metadata for all the compute frameworks. And it will automatically syncing those metadata. So if you make any changes to your remote storage, it will reflect in Elastio. And if the data is invalidated, and Elastio will think, oh, maybe this data is outdated. I need to fetch new. And it will automatically fetch the new data. So in this case, we don't need to like copy our whole Hadoop data set to our compute center to be used by our compute frameworks. And Alasio will, will fetch in those used data for you. And also Alasio will catch in the data uh, in the compute center, which means that the Presto and Spark will fetch in the local data and fetch in the local metadata, which, you, which is similar to you running Spark and Presto in the single cluster co-located with Hadoop. The, uh, with HDFS, but they actually are separate. And but this this uh, structure looks pretty good. But there was bringing out another problem is that uh, if we we can more easily to identify that how many new data we we'll have in our HDFS, so we can guess maybe next three months we will have. Uh, 30% more data, and then we just expand our workers' capacity. However, for the compute, it's, it's a much harder to guess uh, how many machines that we need and how many compute centers that we need. For some long-running and consistent compute workloads, we can for surely build an on-premise compute center for you. However, uh, sometimes we may have some testing workloads, we may have some ephemeral workloads, or we may have some new uh, usage uh, and new compute workloads. That is important, but we are not sure how big this workload will need, how many resources it will need. So for those new requirements, instead of putting it directly into our own, our, uh, own, our on premise compute center, maybe we can use another way. 
So that's why we think maybe we can embrace the public cloud. So considering you may want to build several compute centers, some with the service level agreement, some without, or you want to build a compute cluster uh, temporarily just for your test workloads, then maybe we can embrace the public cloud. Because in public cloud, it can scaling and on-demand provisioning of our compute and also storage. You can ask for as many machines as you want in any region and just asking them and they will provide you all those machines. And it's in a reduced cost and you will not exhaust your existing infrastructure just because you have new compute workloads. And then we consider that maybe public cloud is that good. So should we just move everything that we have to the public cloud? But know that we already have so many existing infrastructure on premise. We don't want to just throw them in once. And also there may be some regulatory restriction prevent you from throwing them all. And also uh, considering if we want to move our whole data center like move all our data from HDFS to S3. This process may take several days based on how many data that you have. And but but with the basically our compute workloads cannot tolerate such long time of that such long downtime. And we also have some existing data ingestion pipeline that will keep generating data to store in HDFS. Changing all those pipelines and workloads to using another storage other than HDFS may take a long time. So we may not want to like do a full transfer. Oh, sorry, I may, I may close my mute my so. Okay. So which bring us to come out with this zero copy bursting compute for hybrid cloud solution. Basically, we can first keep our HDF on premise because it may take a long time to move our data and that's not tolerable. But moving the compute side to the public cloud may be much more easier. Considering that the difficulty of creating the compute cluster is basically how to install and configure those frameworks, like how to configure and install Presto, Spark, or Elastio, and all those things is provisioned and managed by ENR cluster, by AWS ENR or something like Google Data Proc. So and so the, the AWS ENR and GCP Google Cloud can help us take care of the installation and the configuring part. And also uh, considering that we have a compute cluster already on cloud, if we think that oh this cluster is not big enough we can simply add more workers to it to add capacity to your existing cluster. Or you think that maybe I need another cluster of uh, to suit another, another use case, then I can add another compute cluster. Or if I want to move the compute cluster from one region to another region, it will also be much easier by using the AWS ENR. And also it will be really cost effectiveness because the workload is reduced on our on-prem cluster. And we also reduce the data transfer need. Uh, this is basically because Elastio's effort. Elastio basically orchestrates the compute access to the on-prem data. So for example, for your Presto queries, the first time you run a query, if the data is on not already fetched in Elastio, it will go to the HDFS and fetch those data. When you fetch the data, Elastio will also catch those data and also the related metadata. And then for the Presto to run the same query for the second time, they will directly go to Elastio to for the data. And those data are stored in the same cluster as Presto. So in this case, we largely reduce the need to go through the whole network which may our compute framework to have a better local performance. And also uh, it's more consistent because you don't need to go through the outer network, you just go through your inter-cluster network. 
And all this process resulting any of the manual copy on synchronizing data, which means that you don't need to define what data set you are going to copy from your data center to your pub, to your compute center. And if you make some changes to your HDFS, Elastio will automatically syncing those data, syncing those changes to the compute cluster. So, so that uh, just like everything is done by Elastio, so Presto and Spark don't need to worry about how to get their data and how to catching or syncing the data. So this is the main the solution that we suggest. And this solution is mostly useful when you have when your compute is remote from your data center. All your data center already have a really heavy load, like many frameworks already querying data from this center, and they have a limited network capacity. And also when that the traffic between your compute and your data center is slow. Oh, or you don't want to throw a bunch of money to spin up the network. Uh, if you guys have any questions, feel free to ask in the in our Slack channel. And so this brings us to today's demo. So, so as you guys see before that we have a, this zero copy bursting solution with a Hadoop distributed file system and a public cloud with hosting the compute framework together with Elastio. So we want to give a demo which shows which we will be making this scenario in the AWS ENR. So basically we will have two clusters which one of the Apache Hadoop storage cluster, which we're using to move in the on-premise HDF data center, but because we don't have the on-premise one. So that's why we, uh, we create this mocking. So this uh, Hadoop- so, uh, so actually, Lou, so yeah. before, we go, uh, before we go with more details of the demo, uh, so uh, I want to pause here a little bit. Sorry, uh, yeah, I just pause here a little bit and see first if there's anyone have any question either you can just ping me the question or post the question on slack i'm happy to help and meanwhile i created a pool so this may take a few minutes a uh, few seconds for you to finish uh, basically telling us whether you want to uh, which stage you are already in engaging with aloxia yeah just take a few minutes, uh, just took a few seconds to finish this. Okay, we have like a, a, a few more people. Okay, we will close the pool now. Yeah. Uh, yeah, in case you have any questions, uh, we are happy to help on Slack. And yeah, Lou, you can continue on the demo. Okay, thanks, Bing. Yeah, our demo is pretty like details. And basically, we have two AWS ER clusters uh, using Terraform. So we will launch all the resources using Terraform. As for who, some of you guys that maybe not that familiar with Terraform, Terraform is a really good tool that we can you, we can use some really simple discrete piece language to decide what resources we are going to create. And then we can use really simple commands to launch all the resources in once. So in this case, we're using Terraform to launch two AWS ENR clusters together with all the resources that are needed for these two clusters. So we have a HDFS cluster in one region, and we have a compute cluster with Presto and Elastio in another region. And these two clusters will be connecting together using a thing called VPC peering. Basically, it's using to speed up the network transfer between these two clusters. And for the Hadoop cluster, the HDFS cluster, we are using it to mocking your on-premise data center. Uh, 
which is usually not in the public cloud, but here we put it here just to showcase how it works. And for our compute center, uh, the Alasio is pre-configured to connecting to mounting the HDFS as Alasio mount point, which means that all the Presto queries that go to the remote HDFS will go to it via Alasio. And Alasio will have like an obstruction layer to connect to the HDFS and caching data locally. And Presto is also pre-configured to connect to the remote Hive Meta store, uh, and it can assess the remote HDFS via Alasio. And please know that for here, uh, to, for Presto to use Alasio, we only need to configure on the Presto side. There is no changes to all the Hadoop, all the HDFS, or the Hive tables. We don't change anything there. So now I will start getting out the demo. So basically, we have a tutorial, a really quick start tutorial to set up both clusters using Terraform and run an actual queries. So for the AWS tutorials, I will send it in the Slack channel. If you guys want to watch it and see what I'm actually doing. So basically, this is the AWS tutorial that help us to setting up the hybrid cloud uh, demo. Actually, it's a demo tutorial. And in the 2.3, we will give out more details about how to connect to the compute cluster to your actual on-premise cluster. But here, now we, we have a demo to showcase how it actually works. So basically, we will create these two clusters, the HDF cluster and the compute cluster. And what it would, and what cluster it will create, it, and also the commands to create those clusters. So I will not go really details into what into this doc, but feel free to read after the after the presentation or whenever you want. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask in the Slack channel. If you're yeah. running into any problems, feel free to report to us. <laughs> yeah, the link is in uh, is posted in Slack channel. So you can always do retrieve. And uh, in addition, we will uh, we will we, we are recording this session and we will provide it online so we can always play back this session afterwards. Yeah, and also like I will start my demo, so I will use my terminal now. But I will copy the links from this tutorial to my terminal. So in case you guys don't know where which command I'm copying, feel free to open the link. So I will just like in a random random directory. So the first thing I do is I just download the all the Terraform files in order to create a hybrid class. So it's a public S3 address that everybody can should be able to download it. It's a tar file, so I need to untar this, untar this directory, and also hash to those this directory. And basically, what inside this directory is a bunch of Terraform files which describe what resources I am going to create. Like for example, what ENR cluster I am going to create, and all the related resources related to, to this ENR cluster, like its security group or some of the VPCs, subnets, et cetera. And also there is a variable set TF that describes what variables you can, you can present. Like for example, you can choose which region of the cluster that you are going to launch. Uh, for this tutorial, we go with the, the most, uh, the one that's shown in our tutorial by default. We will create the on-premise cluster in US West 1. And we will create a compute cluster in US East 2. If you want to change the default to more match your case, like if your uh, data center is in, uh, is in the Singapore or your, your compute is in here, then you can feel free to change it. So uh, then we, we have all the Terraform file for uh, for all the resources that we're going to create, then we need to do Terraform init. 
Basically, Tiny Phone need is change from our descriptive language to a more executable uh, program. Like it will download all the dependencies, like the AWS provider, which allows me to create the AWS resources. And it should be finished pretty quick. Mm, now it is a little longer. So basically it is installing all the dependencies. And sometimes it may take a longer time for you to download some plugins like AWS because it may be bigger. Oh yeah, then it finished. Then we have all the descriptive languages, uh, Terraform files for decide what, what we want to create. And we have all the dependencies that allow us to create those those resources. Then we run a single command just to create all the resources. So by running the Terraform apply, we, uh, the Terraform will give you an executable plan, which means that, okay, what resources I am going to create. For here, as you guys can see, it will create so many different resources, including the ENR cluster and all the resources needed to create the ENR clusters. It's totally 40 resources. Considering if I give a tutorial or something or some document that asks you to create 40 resources, that it, we each will have different configuration. It will be really painful and really easy to have errors. But by using Terraform, we already found out all the bugs or other things, and we already test it for several runs. We make sure that each configure is correct. So in this case, it's much less error and much easier to control the whole environment. So, so maybe, uh, so let me just pause here a little bit. Uh, Lou, you were involved in some other, like in earlier, our earlier in engagement with the cloud, all this cloud infrastructure, right? So now we uh, basically, we, we made several steps and finally we decided, oh, let's go with uh, Terraform, right? And yeah. we were inv involved in several projects like this. Uh, what's what's the, like, what what is why we make this choice and like, we finally decided to use Terraform and compared yeah. to some other uh, approaches, what's the pros and cons? Yeah, we be previously we chose to have the, using the cloud formation template. And um, some of you guys may be familiar. It's quite similar to Terraform Spreads. Just you describe what resources you need, and um, AWS will help you to create the resources. It's quite similar, but we found one drawback of cloud formation template is that it used really well in a single region, in a single cluster. For example, if you only want to create a data center or you only want to create a compute cluster, uh, the cloud formation template actually works well. But Consider you want to like have different resources in different regions and you want to connect them together. The loose, then in this case, cloud formation doesn't work that much well. And also uh, for the cloud formation is solely for AWS, but Terraform, something like Terraform, it works well for different providers. Like they have the, we have AWS plugin, but there also be some GCP plugin or Azure plugin, et cetera. So we can use the similar ways to create resources for other providers. Oh, that's great. Good to know, yeah, thanks. And, and also we, we previously considered using like something like ENR, just like giving the Elastio bootstrap and putting, um, so that we can launch Elastio also in the ENR cluster which in this that case is also a single cluster environment. But here we also, we can launch multiple clusters. I think that's a big benefit of Terraform. Easy to use and you can launch resources in a bunch of regions and a bunch of clusters together. And here, uh, usually you would type yes, which means that you will create all those resources. But for here, uh, I um, actually I can create yes, but it takes us, takes a long time to, not a long time, usually it takes like 15 minutes for me to create all the resources and create the two clusters. But for here, because we are using a demo, so I'm not going to wait for this 15 minutes. And I have a exactly the same already created cluster, which you guys can see that uh, 
it already create all the resources needed. And uh, you say apply completed, and uh, we created 40 resources. And it gives us an output. And basically the output tells us the master DNS address of our own prime cluster and also the Elastio Compute cluster. And this too will help us to SSH into the clusters. So basically, I want to SSH into the on-prem cluster first. I can simply just like SSH how do and copy the on-prem master public DNS. The reason that I can use this way is because uh, when I'm creating the ENR clusters, I provide my local public DNS. And in this case, I can use my local private uh, private SSH key to to as to SSH into the cluster. I provide them the public SSH key and where I can use the local default private SSH key to SSH into the cluster. So now let's go here. And this is the on premise state cluster. And you can see we already installed the date, the Hadoop Nano here. So to remember, this is the on prem cluster. And also then we can copy the Alasio Hadoop master DNS address for us to SSH into the Hadoop center, the other uh, compute center, using the same way. If we do JPS, we can see here that uh, this cluster have pre-installed Presto, the Presto server, and it has pre-installed Alasio, Alasio master. So this is our compute center. And then we can follow in our docs. So today our demo will show how to run a Presto queries. So which means that our data center have to have some data there for us to run the Presto query. So the first step that I will do is that in our own prime cluster, I will try to download some TPCDS data. Uh, the TPCDS is basically a popular benchmark in the data area. And for here, for the time consideration, I will only copy two tables into our HDFS cluster. And these two tables is sufficient for us to run one query. But when you guys are following the tutorial, feel free to load whatever data set you want. And also to create the tables that you want and run whatever Presto query that you want. We just give a really simple example to showcase how you can use this cluster. Basically, we create two clusters that is pretty empty and pre-configured that you can run any queries that you want. So now here, it may take some time for us to download in the data from S3 to local HDFS. But in the real case, your on-prem cluster already have a bunch of data there and you already have some hive tables created there so you don't need to go through the prepared data and prepare table situ uh, stages we create a two table this is the second table And then after creating the, the tables, what we'll do is that we will use the existing tables and create uh, existing table data to create the hive tables. So following this tutorial is basically just copying all the commands to your terminal. And after you're familiar how to use how to run those personal queries and how to use the clusters, you can uh, you can run whatever commands or whatever data you want.
okay, we finish creating the data that we need. Then we will get our create tables statement. This create table statement basically will create the tables for the data that we just just loaded. The store sales table and the uh, the store sales table and the items table. And also we will create a third table which is called students, which is not for the Presto query, but for another use case that we I will want to show you guys later. So I will details about that table later. So basically now we are just creating the table with all those data already in HDFS. Now we already have those data and table ready for us to use to us to run the Presto query. In this case, uh, we will go to the our compute cluster here. And, also, and then we will try to run an example Presto queries just to get the Presto query. And then we can run the Presto all queries here. Maybe I could leave it. So uh, the catalog here is a special catalog, which is called on print catalog. When it's running, we can see. Yeah, it's called the on print catalog, which this on print catalog will is pre-configured to connect to the remote Hive Meta store. And it's pre-configured to connect to the remote HDFS via Alasio. If, and then it, it will take some time to run the Presto queries because in this time we are fetching the data remotely, which means that uh, the data is not pre-catched in Alasio. And the Presto need to go to the remote HDFS to get all the data he want. So in the first query, it may take a little longer. I seven it to take several minutes. So if you guys have any questions, in, this is a really good time to ask. So when the process is always when the Presto trying to uh, Assess the remote HDFS. Uh, it will it will fetch the remote data to the current compute cluster, and when it arrive in the compute cluster, Alasio will try to catch those data for you. And you know, guys, for Presto, they do many of the optimizations. So usually, it only fetch a small set of the whole data set. It only fetch the small set of the using data, which is hard to learn by users. We don't know which part is actually needed. But Alasio will only catch the youth part, the working cell of the data. So, Lu, uh, we yeah. do have a question on Slack. So, uh, basically, Jung Wang from Slack is asking uh, what zero copy means in this context. Uh, zero copy basically means that uh, we have a compute cluster which is remote from our HDFS cluster. But how can we make the data available? for those compute, cl compute cluster like the Presto or Spark. We don't need to copy the HDF data to our compute cluster. This is the zero copy and Alasio will cache for you so that in the next several Presto runs, it will directly using the local data without you do manually copy. Yeah, so uh, I want just to add on that. Uh, traditionally, if you want to run a architecture like this, the most common way is you uh, you have compute resources in a different and a remote place, and you just want to run some e either ETL process or some uh, copy process to move the data or the data you need into this remote resource in a remote location. And in that case, this can be either error prone, and also you can end up with copying like unnecessary data. Uh, the data is not really actually used a search and you have to clean this up like a manually in the background later so this can be uh, error prone too or sometimes people just forget to do that and the resource get uh, used up so we uh, the approach we're providing here is basically it's a transparent everything is transparent to the end user you just like a, oh I'm, I'm querying data locally but in fact Aluxio is doing the heavy lifting by moving 
only the part of data you need into the remote resource, in, into the remote compute cluster. And later on, uh, if you have similar query or a query like using the same set of data, they will also be benefit from this previous query. So that's what we mean by zero copy. You don't have to manually run some copy. Yeah. Okay. So it sounds like the it looks like the query is, uh, is succeed. Yeah. Yeah. So in this case, we can check if Elastio is actually catching those data. We can see that Elastio has used capacity, which means that it already catched those data for the previous query. So if we run the same query again, or we run other queries that using the similar data, that it, we can feel that the, the speed, we are actually speed out the query because now data is locally, it's in the single cluster. Uh, Lou, we have another question here. Yeah. Uh, does Presto with Aluxio combination has a higher uh, high ETA on the first time query? Alternatively, how the queries fare better on subsequent execution of same query, assuming returning similar or same dataset rows? It's also yeah, it, from Slack. Yeah, it, we usually have a high higher STA on the first time query because the first time query this data is cold, which means that it needs to be fetched from remote HDFS. Alasio doesn't catch those data. In the second query, because in the when we run the first query, we already catch all those data in in the Glacio cluster. So the, all the subsequent queries will be faster uh, compared to the first query. Um, so basically, there are two parts. Uh, two parts to the answer. I, I just want yeah, I think that I agree with what all what Lou said. I just want to add a little bit. So first, uh, the first query is supposed to be like a it takes longer than subsequent queries that's true because you have to move the data that's the physics <laughs> no one can change that but after that there are two parts contributing to performance gain performance improvement one part is the moving the data alone like uh, you you don't have to move the bytes across a while again because it's already cached in Alexio. The second part is really uh, interestingly we, we sometimes we found this second part is even more important is on the metadata. So Alexio itself also has the uh, metadata service we call master node and this node keeps the file system information about the files, the, the tree direct uh, the structures, uh, permissions, all this like Presto or Spark. When they do the query planning they often need to consult uh, this kind of information to make the query plan. And then uh, if the data is remote or uh, it's uh, maybe in some slow network, then this can be the bottleneck a lot, uh, quite often actually. And we found having this part catch into Alexio, uh, great, this, we call this metadata catch in Alexio, greatly helps improve the subsequent queries. Yeah, usually uh, the performance gain is come from the the network difference between your inter-cluster network on and the and the network between the clusters. And in this case, uh, usually the AWS they made so much effort to improving the network between two ENR clusters. For they for the VPC peering, they actually use a really huge machines and expensive machines to speed up the network. So when we are testing these two cluster, uh, the network between the clusters is sim quite similar to the network performance within the clusters. And this is the case that Alasio will not show too much benefits. But in more reality environment, if the two in the network between the two cluster is either either slower or the cost is really high, then you may want to take Alasio into consideration. So, and also one thing is that uh, if you go over the network, the performance is inconsistent. Uh, but consider everything is in the single cluster, the intercommunication will be will have will make the performance more consistent. So this is uh, and then then if you continue to run um, multiple queries, we will have we will bring a similar performance. And also one thing that I want to show you guys is about the 
the metadata uh, the automatically metadata synchronization between the two clusters. For example, when we are running the Presto queries to select from our third tables that we just created, only have two fields. One is Fred have an age 32 and Brandy have an age 35. And then we what if uh, we want to make some update to the data set? For example, in our HDFS, there is some data changes. What it, what will it affect our our compute cluster? Usually, in this case, is that we copy the data from HDFS to our compute once, and then we make some changes to our uh, our on-premise data. And then we feel, oh, maybe the compute data set is out there. We need to abandon it and copy the whole again, which is quite costly and inconvenient. But in, with Elasio, like, for example, in our on-prem cluster, we change, we swap the age of these two students. And if we do the queries in our on-premise data center, you can actually see that the age is swapped. You see here the Fred becomes 35 and Brad Denny is 32, while in our compute, compute queries, previously Fred is 32 and Brad Denny is 35. And then we can run the same query again to see if the changes is reflected in our compute cluster. You can see that Fred also becomes 35 and Brad Denny becomes 32. The age is actually swapped. This is mainly because Alasio have a mechanism to uh, automatically syncing your HDFS changes to Alasio. So we will know that, okay, what change you made in the recent, maybe recent 10 minutes, and we will update all those changes in Alasio automatically. So this is come to our solution, why we are zero copy, uh, why we don't have some manual metadata syncing needed. And that's it for our current today's demo. And um, I will go back to the slides. Yeah, if you have any further question regarding the demo, the contacts or anything related to Aluxio or in, in general, like the analytics uh, workloads, big data, cloud, happy to chat. We will stay here for maybe another five minutes uh, if you have any question. Or maybe I can talk about the last slide. Oh yeah, you have to have slide. Go ahead. <laughs> about because previously we move in the compute to the cloud, but basically we can also move in the data to the cloud. So Alasio have a new feature called Alasio Policy Driven Data Management. Basically, it can we can decide how we're going to move data. For example, Alasio we have a two choose under storage. One is HDFS and the other is S3. We can decide how to move data between these two storage. You can set a rule that, oh, I, I want to migrate data which has not been used for seven days from HDFS to S3. In this case, if there is no a hard switch over between over between HDFS and S3, we can migrate the data continuously while not affecting our workloads. I will not give too much detail here. If you have questions, please read the the link here, let me open it and share in the Slack channel. Feel free to read this. And if you have any questions, you can feel free to ask us through the Slack channel. But basically we also help in the moving data area. So, so that allows you to have its position in moving Kukala, both data and compute. Oh, there's one more question for you, Lou. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think you know this context better uh, than me. Does data policy can include privacy and or security policies? Um, basically, when you're mounting some storage like HDFS and S3 into Alasio, you already provide your security settings. So, uh, so, so which means that you already agree to to migrate the data between these two storage. Then we then we don't have any like. Uh, what's it mean by the privacy and security policy? Will you, will you, 
when we're mounting the storage, we already agree to want to do the data migration between the two mount points. Then we just directly migrate them based on the policy that users defines. Well, I think for now, the data policy we mentioned here is more like a data storage policy uh, with some to some degree, some security policies, like for example, we uh, we can integrate with different uh, security authentication schemes like uh, Kerbos, or like you can have one uh, one storage like uh, with Kerbos, the other is using some cloud uh, security policy, and uh, for 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 the for the for the part we are talking about here, it's more like oh, I want to uh, migrate data when the data age is older than certain days, and then I start to do some data migration. Um, that, that's my understanding for the data policy engine. Cool. Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, the Slack channel is basically open 24 seven. So whenever you have any question, feel free to post the question there. I and Lou are happy to help from Slack. And but we're 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 going to uh, conclude with the today's session. I thank thanks so much with Lou. I think the, I also learned a lot from your work. Thanks, Dean. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Thank you everyone joining the session. Thank you, everyone. Hope you enjoy. And the 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 playback will be available very soon, and we will notice notice you. Thank you. Thank you.